James Huberty was born in Canton, Ohio on October 11, 1942. He was the second of two children to parents Earl Vincent Huberty, a quality inspector, and Eichel Evelon Huberty, a homemaker. Their household was deeply religious and they were regular attendees of local United Methodist churches. When Huberty reached three years old, he contracted polio. He was required to wear steel and leather braces on both of his legs as a young child. Eventually, Huberty recovered from the ailment, but was left with a mild limp for the rest of his life. Although the family appeared to be relatively normal, there were issues brewing inside. In 1950, Earl purchased a 155-acre farm in Mount Eaton, a small Amish village in Wayne County, Ohio. Eichel absolutely refused to live in this rural village and would not even go to view the property. In a harsh move, she decided to abandon the family to go to Tucson, Arizona and become a sidewalk preacher as a Pentecostal missionary. Huberty was deeply devastated by the abandonment. Huberty blamed God for taking his mother away from him. As Huberty grew, he was emotionally distant with very few friends. He developed an interest in firearms and consistently practiced shooting at targets with a pistol. Due to this interest, as he approached his teenage years, he became known as an amateur gunsmith. Beyond this drive, though, his limp, religious family and reluctance to socialize made him a target of bullies at Waynedale High School. He did eventually graduate as an average student in 1960 and went on to attend Malone College in 1962. Initially, he studied sociology, but left to study at the Pittsburgh Institute of Mortuary Science. He graduated with honors in 1964, was issued a funeral director's license, and then issued an embalmer's license a year later. In 1965, Huberty married Etna Markland, whom he met at Malone College. After the wedding, Huberty was hired by a funeral home in Canton, Ohio. In his employment, he would have minor conflicts with his superiors due to his introverted personality and difficulty in dealing with the public. After two years, he left the job and became a welder for a firm in Louisville, Kentucky. He stayed with this firm for a few years and moved up to Babcock and Wilcox in June 1969. Although reclusive, Huberty was deemed a reliable worker and had earned numerous promotions over the years. As he began to earn a higher salary, he and his wife moved into a large home in an affluent area of Massillon, Ohio. In 1971, their home had been destroyed in a fire, and they bought another house on the same street. On this lot, they built a six-unit apartment building to manage. During this time, they welcomed daughters Zelia and Cassandra in 1972 and 1974. Life was going well for the Huberty family. But like before with his childhood, trouble was already showing. Huberty had a history of domestic violence towards his daughters and wife. On one occasion, Etna filed a report with Children and Family Services stating that Huberty had messed up her jaw. In 1976, Etna tried repeatedly to convince Huberty to seek counseling, but he refused. In order to minimize his temper, anxiety, and paranoia, Edna developed a process in which she claimed to be able to read his future with tarot cards. Huberty believed this and the readings would give him a calming effect. In many cases, Huberty would follow the recommendations Edna would make during the readings. This was her way of reducing his agitation and control his behavior. To co-workers and neighbors, though, Huberty was ill-tempered and seemed to be paranoid. He appeared to be obsessed with firearms and would hold a grudge towards any perceived setback or slight against him or his family. Sometimes he would retaliate in response to real or perceived injustice to settle his debts. And conflicts with neighbors once led to his attainment on charges of disorderly conduct. At one point, he informed the father of two girls he had encouraged his daughters to fight in response to a conflict between the girls that, I believe in paying my debts both good and bad. As time went on, Huberty dug deeper into conspiracy theories and was a self-proclaimed survivalist. He believed that an escalation of the Cold War was inevitable and that President Jimmy Carter and later Ronald Reagan and the government as a whole were conspiring against him. 
He thought that Soviet aggression and the collapse of society was near and started to stock his house with supplies of non-perishable foods and guns. According to a family acquaintance, the Huberty home was stocked full of loaded safety off firearms to the point that one could reach anywhere and grab a gun. In November 1982, Huberty was laid off from his welding job and became deeply depressed over his inability to provide for his family. Edna claimed that after her husband was laid off, he began to hear voices and at one point in 1983, he placed a pistol to his temple and threatened to kill himself. Etna dissuaded Huberty from doing so, but he remarked later that she should have just let him do it. Huberty was unable to find work in Ohio and the family sold their apartment building in the spring of 1983. In the summer, the family applied for residency in Mexico under the idea that the money from the apartment building would last longer there. They sold their home in September of that year and Huberty informed family acquaintances that they were leaving for Tijuana. In October 1983, the family moved to Tijuana and left nearly everything except for the guns, ammunition, and survival supplies in storage in Ohio. Etna and their daughters embraced their new home and quickly became friends with neighbors. Huberty, on the other hand, spoke little Spanish and became even more withdrawn from society. He was unable to find employment in Tijuana and deeply regretted the decision to move to Mexico. Within just three months, he had the family pack up and moved them to San Ysidro, a poor district of San Diego just north of the Mexico-U.S. border. When the family arrived in San Ysidro, they rented an apartment at the Cottonwood Apartment Complex while Huberty looked for work. Being the only Anglo-Americans at the complex, Huberty was irritated and rude to their neighbors. Shortly after moving in, Huberty applied to a security guard training program. He completed the course on April 12, 1984, and obtained employment with a security firm that assigned him to guard a condominium complex. His new salary enabled the family to have their belongings shipped in from Ohio and to move to a two-bedroom apartment. On July 10th of that year, Huberty was let go from a security job. His employers informed him that his dismissal was due to poor work performance and a general physical instability. On July 15th, Huberty told Etna that he believed he had a mental health problem. Two days later, he called a San Diego mental health clinic for an appointment. He was assured that the clinic would return his call within a few hours. He sat quietly beside the telephone for several hours, but abruptly walked out of the house and left on his motorcycle. What he did not know was that the clinic receptionist had misspelled his name as Schuberty and due to his polite demeanor and no previous hospitalization for mental health issues, did not create a sense of urgency, and he was logged as non-crisis to be handled within 48 hours. An hour after leaving the house, Huberty returned in a generally pleasant mood. After dinner, the family cycled out to a nearby park, and later in the evening, he and Etna watched a film together on the television. On the morning of July 18th, the family visited the San Diego Zoo. While walking around, Huberty brought up to Edna that he believed that his life was over. When mentioning how he never got a call back from the clinic, he said, well, society had their chance. The family left the zoo and ate lunch at a McDonald's in the Claremont neighborhood of San Diego. After returning home, Huberty walked into his bedroom to his wife relaxing on the bed. He leaned towards her and said, I want to kiss you goodbye. Edna kissed Huberty and asked where he was going. He responded that he was going hunting, hunting for humans. Carrying a gun across his shoulder and a box of ammunition, he briefly told his eldest daughter goodbye and left. He was seen entering the parking lot of a McDonald's restaurant about 200 yards away from his apartment at around 4 p.m. In his possession were a 9mm semi-automatic pistol, a 9mm Uzi, a 12-gauge pump-action shotgun, and hundreds of rounds of ammunition for each weapon. Upon entering the McDonald's, Huberty aimed his shotgun at a 16-year-old employee named John Arnold. According to Arnold, when Huberty pulled the trigger, nothing happened. As Huberty inspected the gun, Arnold, thinking it was a bad joke, walked away as Neva Kane, the manager, walked towards the service counter. 
Huberty aimed the Uzi at Kane and shot. Kane died minutes later. Huberty then fired a shotgun at Arnold, wounding him, and shouted, Everybody on the ground. As he yelled racist obscenities, 25-year-old Victor Rivera tried to persuade Huberty to not shoot anyone else. Huberty then shot Rivera 14 times. Huberty turned his attention towards six women and children huddled together. One by one, he began to shoot each of them, ranging in age from 8 months to 19 years old. 15-year-old Imelda and 11-year-old Aurora had survived the attack. Huberty then shot and killed a 62-year-old trucker before targeting a family near the play area who had tried to shield their son and his friend beneath the tables. Blythe Herrera was shielding her son Mateo under one booth, while her husband Ronald protected Keith Thomas across from them. Both Keith Thomas and Ronald Herrera were shot but survived. Blythe and Mateo were killed by numerous gunshots to the head. As Huberty continued his spree, the first of many calls to emergency services were placed shortly after 4 p.m. The dispatcher mistakenly sent responding officers to another McDonald's two miles away. This error caused a delay in creating a lockdown by several minutes, and the only warning to civilians walking, riding, or driving towards the McDonald's were given by passerbys. One woman, Lydia Flores, drove up to the restaurant after the shooting had begun. She stopped at the food pickup window and noticed the sounds of gunfire. She looked in and saw Huberty shooting. She reversed her vehicle until crashing into a fence and hid in the bushes with her two-year-old daughter until the shooting ended. Another couple with their four-month-old daughter drove to the restaurant and noticed the shattered glass. They thought the restaurant was undergoing renovations and that Huberty walking towards their car was a repairman. Huberty then fired upon their car with the Uzi and shotgun. Both of them and their daughter were seriously wounded, but all had survived. Around the same time, three 11-year-old boys had ridden their bikes over to purchase Sundays. Upon hearing someone nearby yelling at them, they hesitated, but then Huberty shot all three with his shotgun and Uzi. Only one of the boys survived the ambush. After shooting the three boys, Huberty noticed an elderly couple, Miguel Victoria and Ida Victoria, walking towards the entrance. As Miguel reached to hold the door open for his wife, Huberty fired his shotgun and killed Ida and wounded Miguel. An uninjured survivor reported observing Miguel cradling Ida in his arms while shouting curses at Huberty. Huberty approached, swore at Miguel, and then shot him in the head, killing him. Ten minutes after the first call to emergency services was made, police arrived to the correct McDonald's. The first officer on scene, Miguel Rosario, reported what was happening to the San Diego Police Department as Huberty was firing in his patrol vehicle. A lockdown on the area was immediately imposed spanning six blocks from the site. 175 officers were deployed in strategic areas around the restaurant. The SWAT team arrived within the hour and took positions around the location as well. The police had difficulty determining if there were any hostages, but one individual who managed to escape informed them that there was a single gunman, no hostages, and he was shooting anyone he encountered. At 5.05 p.m., police were authorized to kill the perpetrator if they obtained a clear shot. Several survivors of the shooting reported that they saw Huberty walking towards the service counter with a portable radio, select a music station, and carry on shooting while dancing to the music. Shortly after, he searched the kitchen and found six employees and yelled out, Oh, there's more. You're trying to hide from me. One of the female employees screamed out in Spanish, Don't kill me, don't kill me, before Huberty Owen fired, killing three employees and wounding one. One employee was able to escape and joined four others and a customer and hid inside a basement utility room. The wounded employee managed to crawl to the utility room after being shot numerous times. Huberty had returned to the main lobby and continued shooting anyone who appeared to be alive. At 5.17 p.m., Huberty walked from the service counter towards a doorway close to the drive-in window. This move afforded 27-year-old SWAT sniper Charles Foster an unobstructed view of Huberty's body. Foster fired a single round, 
and the bullet entered Huberty's chest. Huberty was sent falling backwards onto the floor in front of the service counter, killing him instantly. The entire incident lasted for 77 minutes, with Huberty firing a minimum of 257 rounds. He killed 20 people and wounded many others. Only 10 people inside the restaurant were uninjured, six of whom had hidden in the basement utility room. In the days following the massacre, McDonald's temporarily suspended all television and radio advertisements. In an act of solidarity, business rival Burger King did the same for their advertisements. Huberty's body was cremated on July 23rd with no religious service observed. Huberty's wife Etna and their daughters received many death threats and resided with a family friend. All three of them attended counseling for over nine months. They eventually relocated to Chula Vista, and their daughters enrolled in school under different names. After a year, they moved to the community of Spring Valley. Within two days of the shooting, the San Ysidro McDonald's was refurbished and renovated. It planned to open again with the hope that, as commented by an employee, the building would become just another McDonald's. After discussions with the community leaders and executives, it was decided that the restaurant would not reopen, and the restaurant was demolished at midnight on September 26. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and consider subscribing to the channel for more Criminal Connections.